let you go ahead and introduce yourselves if you want to start, Harriet. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Harriet Ford, um, and my company is Harriet Ford Design. We do high end residential and commercial work in the UK, sometimes abroad, and uh, the company's been going for about 19 years. Got my own uh, Hi, everybody. My name is Brian Wolf. I'm the founder and creative director of Design by Wolf. Um, I set up the company nearly 10 years ago and specialising in residential interior design, work based here in the UK, but working globally. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Hinderdahl. I'm Operations Partner at Design House Liberty. We're a multidisciplinary architecture and interiors practice started about five years ago and we've just expanded into Hong Kong. Okay, so let's start with Pitching 101. Uh, Lisa, how often does Design House Liberty pitch to new clients? Sure, so um, it really depends on the scale of projects. So I'd say large scale commercial buildings is about once a month. Um, and then weekly we're doing smaller pitches for residential projects in London. Brian? Um, I think only about 10% of the time for the projects that we eventually <coughs> take on. It's, it's a very small number. Our work primarily comes from referrals or word of mouth. And if you would have had to say how many pitches you do, maybe per month? <coughs> maybe per one year. year. One a year? Yeah. And Harriet? Um, it really depends. I mean, it, it ebbs and flows, but um, I would say on average we probably do about two pitches a month. Um, and Lisa, who does the pitch because Design House Liberty, how many are you now? We're 25 people. 25 people. So who is the one that goes to do the pitch? Is it always the lead designer? When do you feel it's appropriate to bring more people along? Sure. So the kind of weekly introduction meetings and those pitches are always only the creative director and founder, Dara. And then if we have a larger pitch, we always bring Dara because she has to be there. And then we'll have an operations person and the project manager because many questions will start to get asked in the Q&As. Questions like, can you elaborate? Mean, questions like, um, I think it's about knowing your audience really. So like, who's going to be in the room? Is the QS going to be there? Then I go because I do a lot of the cost management. Um, and they'll start asking me about kind of how are we going to deliver this project? Is somebody going to be there like the project manager? Then you want to have your project manager so you can talk about the program, the delivery. So I think those are really important decisions. And Brian, how much prep goes into your pitch? How long does it take you? What do you do? I think it's important to define what's uh, just a meeting, an informal meeting, with a client, what's a, a pitch. Are you pitching against other interior designers, or are they just wanting to get to know you and your service and a bit about your personality and your style? Um, I will do a lot of research on my clients. If they've already appointed an architect, I'll ask, can I reach out to the architect and have a discussion with the architect ahead of my meeting with the client? I'll ask for existing pictures of the properties. If they've got something on the market for sale now, I might go and see the property. So I will do that kind of in-depth research before I'll go and see somebody and discuss the services. And Harriet, what about you? So what was the question again? No, it's okay. Um, how much prep goes into your pitch? Yeah. Um, it, again, it depends slightly on what the, whether it's just a, a meeting with the client, an informal meeting. I generally get a steer from the client first as to what kind of meeting we're having. If we're meeting at, say, their offices, if we're meeting at the property, if we're meeting at the architect's offices, whether the client just is really informal and wants to meet for a coffee, it, I get a steer from what we're doing. And then I do, as Brian does, do some preparation uh, as to who, who else might be on the team. I'll ask wherever all of our work comes through referrals so I'll ask whoever's been who has referred us um, and then I'll get a sense of what the expectation is and work ourselves up to that and how much of the pitch do you feel is about the actual project pitching about that particular project and how much do you think it's about pitching to a client or a person maybe start with Lisa sure so I think Probably about 90% of it is about that project specifically. I don't think you'll be in the room unless they already know who you are. So I think one of the kind of mistakes we used to make in our pitches when we were in our early days was that we did a lot of intro. So it's our portfolio, this is what we've built, this is what we're doing. Um, that was a huge mistake and we got a lot of feedback on that about three years into being a practice that, you know, take a step back, they already know who you are, you're in the room for a reason, why are you working on this project and what can you give them? And so are all of your pitches typically very similar to one another? Like how much of your pitch is showcasing your portfolio and how much is, of it is actually preparing something about a project? I'd say most of them is preparing at this point. Um, again, it's, I think at this point we're referred or we already know the clients or you're in the room for a reason. So it's really about um, coming with a deck of 
maybe two to three projects that might relate to what you're about to pitch for, and then moving straight into your pitch. I think whether it's a formal pitch or it's that meeting where they want to get to know you and you need to get to know them, the, the one goal I have going in is that I leave knowing that they feel reassured that I've spent time getting to know who they are as a client, what their goals are, what they want to achieve with the project, and giving them the confidence that we will work well together for whether it's a six month project or a three year project. That they, it's important for me to leave that meeting knowing that they're confident with that. And Harriet, are all of your pitches the same or do they quite differ from one another? Um, they, they're different and they're the same. So there's, there's probably, when I'm pitching, um, I'm pitching the company, our skills, but I'm also pitching myself really. So me will always go into the room and I will always pitch me as the person because ultimately it's all about relationships and we've, I've got to make that connection with the client to get their confidence so that they I feel that they, they would like or that they would like to work with us but obviously the specifics of the project are different so I'll skew the project to uh, sorry skew the the, um, the client to the, the discussion to the project but they will get me as a person which is probably the same every time and one question that I get asked a lot, do clients pay for your pitch? Uh, we don't do free pitches. Right. Um, well, I don't really get asked to pitch. If they want me to pitch against another firm and they're requiring design or concept designs for that particular pitch, I will charge for that. Um, we used to do a lot of free pitches. <laughs> um, I think as we got to know people more and they approached us, we stopped pitching for free. And as your company has grown, I'm guessing your pitches have evolved with it. Are there any particular things that you've learned along the way when it comes to pitching or anything that, you know, Lisa, you talked about, you kind of ask yourself a few questions about each project? Yes, I think the, the biggest thing we've learned is to call them beforehand. So even though they've reached out to us, we always have an intro call with them to say, what is your main goal here? Why are you taking this project on? Why did you approach us? Um, and I think from that we can gather whether it's going to be the right move for us or whether we're just part of a bigger pool of people because they need to meet a certain quota of applications. I think um, early on again, as Lisa said, having an informal conversation on the phone with the clients, taking the communication off email and making it more personable because if it's, for me, I'm working with private residential clients 100% of the time, I need to have that relationship with them and they need to trust me. It's important to take it away from the formal introductory emails, if they've worked with previous clients of mine and it's come through a referral, it's talking to people that already know that person, working out if they think that the dynamic is going to be right, you know, what, what is their career, where do they live, do they travel a lot, and um, all of that insight will help me target my pitch to the, to the potential client. And Brian, when you and I spoke about this before, you also talked about turning down work that you didn't feel had marketing value, which if anyone knows you, they know that you market your brand really, really well. Um, at what point in your career were you comfortable doing that? Uh, at the start. Um, I think you have to love the projects you're taking on. If you're developing your own brand, yes, you have to pay the bills and you have to run a studio, but there's plenty of work out there. You should be able to find clients out there that want to work with you at the same level and the same standard of craftsmanship that you want to deliver to them. If they don't, just, just walk away. It's just those arguments waiting to happen. Um, Harriet, when we spoke about this, you talked about just a gut feeling that you have. When did you learn to trust that instinct? It took me uh, it took me a while to trust myself. Actually, um, I always have the gut feeling, but I would ignore it and I'd override it. And I think it's just it's going to be okay. And I can sort of if I if I you know uh, behave in a professional way, everyone else will and it'll be fine. And it just isn't. Sometimes you just get clients who just simply don't know how to behave in those sort of situations. And um, you are one of a number of people. And unfortunately, projects can go. You know, they can get skewed by the, just the whole mix of people and there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, so I have learned to pick up as many and listen to as many of the sort of warning signals that go on. And I think as one of your previous um, a panelists said, money is a big thing. If it looks like there's gonna be issues around money, it should be an absolute no-no because there's nothing worse than putting your heart and soul into a project and then not getting paid. It really, I mean, I'll, I'll put up with a difficult client um, 
if they pay on time, I really will, but I won't put up with a, with a client that's not going to pay. So from the start, you can see that I'm like... Um, and in that regard, are there any projects that you particularly regretted taking on, or are there any projects that you regretted turning down? Maybe Lisa? <laughs> Uh, we recently turned down a hotel group in the U.S. Uh, for a pitch because we had done one for them in London and our feeling was, you kind of know who we are already, so why would we pitch again? Um, that was a decision kind of made by the whole management team, but in retrospect, because of how slow moving it was and feeding our pipeline, we realized that was probably the wrong decision. Um. I think everybody has regrets with clients that they've taken on. Um, for me, I try to turn the negatives into a positive and just try to, at the end of a project or a year down the line when I've calmed down, um, <laughs> decide, well, what are my positive takeaways? What can I learn from this? What do I change about my business processes? What, what can I put in place to stop this happening again? And if you can do that, you really can turn a, a negative experience with a client into a positive. And one thing I'd also say is try, you know, you can have an argument with a client and you can fall out with a client. Try and rebuild that connection with them. You may not want to, you may hate their guts, um, but it is important. Your, your reputation is really valuable. You, even whatever has happened or what's been said or what's been done, it's important that you end on good terms with that client. Um, let's talk about pitching around the world because Brian, I know you do lots of projects outside of the UK. How does pitching to clients abroad differ to pitching to clients in the UK? Uh, I think it's more to do with doing research on how that country normally operates. Are they used to going out to pitch or to get five, ten different companies to pitch for a project? Are they expecting you to do full-on design concepts when you walk into a room, setting expectations with them and saying, well, this is what I will provide. Um, I'm working on a, somebody who's actually asked for a pitch or a tender that had the terminology wrong and then they were like, oh, well, it's a pitch. And then I'm like, it's not a pitch, it's an informal meeting. Um, <laughs> you sort of set the expectations and I have very clearly said to them what they can expect for the meeting next Wednesday. This is all I will be doing for the meeting. We'll have a, an informal discussion and when it comes to pricing, I will submit my fee and it will be accompanied by my scope services, but this is what you're going to get. So that they're not then going to be trying to compare you to three other companies. It's, it's, it's very open, it's very transparent and that's for every country and just a little bit of research, call professionals in if you're going to do your first project in New York, we'll all have connections or have worked with somebody or know somebody who's worked with somebody who works in New York, find out how they operate. Same in LA, same in Thailand, same in Hong Kong. Reach out and do a little bit of research before you show up to that presentation. And Lisa, um, your office in Hong Kong, how is that different from your clients in the UK? Um, I think in Hong Kong it's all through referrals, really. Um, the way you network in Hong Kong is very different to the way you network in the UK. Um, I think you, you, know, you go out quite late, you have a meal together, you get to know about their family, and then you meet them again, you ask about their family, and then they refer you to somebody they know. And it's, it's very different. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important to make those relationships, and those relationships will get you work in Asia. I think it's important to add that it, the cultural nuances are really important to pick up on at the very, very beginning, whether you're expected to bring a gift, whether you need to be prepared for a heavy night drinking with the client. Um, if, you, if, you haven't, if you haven't prepared yourself for that, you'll be cut off guard and uh, you're, you're, you're set for failure the minute you walk in. Um, Harriet, what is your favorite part of the pitch? Um, hopefully when the client smiles at the end and looks like they want to hire us. Um, I think um, I actually quite like the, the uh, pre-process. I quite like gathering the information. I like uh, drawing all the, all the bits and pieces together and the, the, it, there's a slight excitement towards it. I'm not mad about the beginning part because a bit like the, uh, the chap doing talk about networking, there's an anxiety moment and I shall be clenching everything <laughs> to, um, to negate that. Um, once I get into my flow, and once I allow myself to be me rather than trying to sell, which I think was another good point that he said, um, that's the bit I enjoy. When I can really let the enthusiasm out about what we do, how we do it, how we approach it, what we can provide for them as a service, um, yeah. where you're walking out and you think, yeah, there's a good chance. Brian, same question. Um, a bit like Harry, I think I enjoy being a detective before the pitch of the presentation. So going in and disarming the client by proving that I've done my research and I know what I'm talking about and I've been around the block, 
you change the the vibe of that meeting straight away. They go, okay, well, this guy has done his homework. Now it can be very informal and we can be a little more comfortable. Um, it's that, that sweet spot in the meeting where it just changes from being a very formal environment to be into something that's a lot more relaxed and everybody's comfortable in it and you leave as friends and even if you don't end up working together, you, um, you'll stay in contact and they may end up referring you to somebody else. And Lisa? Oh, it's a hard one. Um, yeah, I'd say the smile is quite a good one because I think it's really hard when, <laughs> when you first start, especially in formal, and you're kind of thinking, do they like it? Do they not like it? <laughs> And you're, you you love it because you know you designed it, um, and really getting them on board with the idea. And I think that oh, I think that my least favorite part oh, I don't really have a least favorite part of pitching to be honest. <laughs> Nerves. Um, but never mind. How much do you think that the um, winning of a client is actually about the pitch, and how much is it about the brand that you've built? Um, well, I don't know if you would call me the brand, but it's about, it's actually about making that personal connection. So it's, it's primarily, can we work together? So I think it's about the people, the contact, and then the pitch itself, or the design, because we don't do free pitches. We are really only going and presenting ourselves. So uh, we can, once we know there's a connection there, we can actually um, be confident that we're going to have a good communication that will allow us to develop a design for that project that the client will love. But ultimately, it's about us as a company, and, and as I do all the pitching, it's about me, really. Me, me, me. <laughs> Um, I think whether it's a formal pitch or it's just that informal meeting that you have because of a referral, you're there because you've already established a brand and you have a reputation. I think winning, whether it's, it's the formal process that you would do or the less formal ones that I would do, it's the relationship that you and the rapport you build in that very short period of time. That's what wins it. It's not anything else. I agree. I think the pitch is, uh, just depending on how it goes, it's just a gut feeling of are you the right team or not. Um, I think sometimes you go in, you think you're the right team, and they still think you're the right team, but maybe for another project they have on board. And so I think a lot of times, don't be afraid to walk away if you didn't feel like it was the right um, project for you. And uh, you know, you'll grow from as a business. And very last question before we wrap up. Of course, again, everyone here is trying to improve their business. What is one tangible thing that they can take away that you would suggest adding into their pitch? Uh, the, the techniques that Robin gave us earlier, really. Um, I think it, I think confidence, I mean, when I was first working for, I worked for some big hospitality interior design companies before I um, worked, set up my own company. And really, as quite a green young designer, I was pushed into some situations where they were quite scary. And I'm talking about getting off planes from long haul flights and having to do a pitch the next day with jet lag with being given zero presentation skills and in, in front of a, a bunch of 30 businessmen who English isn't their first language. And although I had people with me pitching, it, it, I just, it, it was a really difficult situation. So anything that builds your confidence, practicing, um, learning to be yourself, I think that's the most important thing is just that you as a, as a human being come across because again, I keep on going about the communication. Ultimately, if it's somebody they feel they can relate to. So um, grounding yourself, um, get, giving, feeling comfortable with your own skin, actually talking about what you're presenting to them is, has got to be um, number one priority for a successful pitch. Um, for me, I'd say asking questions. Just ask lots of questions. The meeting isn't about presenting you. You are there because they already know who you are and they've invited you to present yourself. Ask them as many questions as you can, but the most important question to ask is ask them if they have any more questions for you and just keep pushing them at the end of the meeting and, and emphasize that this is their opportunity to, to get rid of any concerns that they may have or uh, they encourage them not to feel stupid. They might, there might be just a silly question about fee structures or contracts or um, how payments would be spread across the term of the contract. Encourage them to ask those questions very early on and then it, it'll help build the trust with them. Um, so I'd say pre-pritch, do a dry run with your team. Um, we do that quite often in the office. So we'll pull in a few of 
the team who worked on the project say, can we pitch to you what you've just worked on? Um, that comes back really well because you get an idea of where their thought process was coming from. If maybe you've missed something and you can put that into your pitch. And then I'd say at the pitch itself, again, knowing your audience, so who are you going to bring this pitch with you? Um, and again, I'm going to go ahead and volunteer all three of you to hang around if everyone has any questions because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for the round tables. Um, so please do approach um, Harriet, Brian, and Lisa if you have any questions about their practice, um, their pitching process. Uh, big round of applause. Thank you so much to all three of you.